I want to thank everyone to come, for, who has come out to listen to an American talk to a fair amount, extent about American women's studies, and also to listen to me in English. But if I attempted, as my friends all know, if I attempted to read in French, it would be torture for you even more than for me. So I am um, very grateful for your indulgence, and I hope that the translation is helpful. Now, I am obviously quite indebted to my dear friend, Francoise de Koch, and her colleagues for the privilege of participating in this series of talks exploring the origins of women's history from its tentative beginnings in the 1960s to its current standing as an, influ as an influential component of the American of the world historical canon. And if you cannot hear me, could you wave, jump up and down, make faces, et cetera? <laughs> can, um, you, can you hear? OK, very good. Thank, and thank, many thanks to our technocrat here who is making this possible. Now, being asked to reflect on one's own role in the development of women's history and women's studies, um, how one advanced from one research project to another, from one methodological and theoretical approach to another, is as daunting intellectually and psychologically as it is exciting. It requires one to step outside oneself and become a critical reviewer of one's own intellectual and political heritage and, and development. Old essays, old conferences take on the appearance of old snapshots, freezing a moment of intellectual development within a specific time frame. One endlessly asks, how did I, how did we get here from there? Or like some latter-day Alice in Wonderland of historical development, what vials of change, theoretical and methodological, did I, did we, consume? What tiny doors did we slip through to find new gardens of historical experiences? I hope that as a US historian, I can bring a comparative perspective to our understanding of the development of women's history and feminist scholarship by asking how themes and theories that surfaced in each of our respective countries interacted with one another. Did they arise naturally from particular political cultural settings, suggesting that similar forces affected women on both sides of the Atlantic? Or originating in one locale, did they travel across national divides as borrowed objects translated and transformed as feminists in different countries and continents learned of one another's political angers and scholarly visions, and in the process revisioned their own experiences? What sea chains did our visions undergo? Looking at how our two uh, countries, France and the United States, encircle the Atlantic raises still other questions. What, if any, impact did the Atlantic have on women in both countries? And can the scholarship um, and, uh, in both countries and on the scholarship on the production of knowledge in each country? Can we begin to think of an Atlantic women's history? What would that history look like? What actors would play the central roles? How far back in time would that history go? Uh, to the 17th and 18th centuries, to the origins of colonialism, the slave trade, and the development of French and American empires built upon plantation slave economies, to the Enlightenment and the Age of Revolution, their promises of universal rights and the denial of those promises to women and persons of African descent, to the rise of scientific racism, sexology, and eugenics in the 19th century, and their objectification of women, persons of color, and sexual deviance. To the related emergence of the biopolitics of modernity, as Foucault elaborated that concept. Are these common patterns that both countries bordering the Atlantic share? To impose some order on these ideas and questions, it is best to go back to beginnings. I can speak of the origins of women's history and feminist studies in the United States and will depend upon you to compare my experiences with yours in France and in Europe generally. I am sure that I speak for all, of all of our experiences when I say that women's studies as it developed on both sides of the Atlantic exploded out of the feminist political movements of the 1960s and 1970s. 
in the state, feminism was the offspring of multifaceted political unrest. The civil rights movement of the night, am I speaking too fast? Yes. Uh, the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s. The anti-Vietnam War movement of the 1960s and 1970s. <coughs> the student movement that exploded internationally in 1968, the Black Panther movement, all had drawn women into a vortex of political protest and outrage, an outrage that expanded exponentially as women activists experienced discrimination and disdain within the protest movements they had embraced. Women made coffee, picketed and demonstrated, built bombs, carried guns, but did not appear as spokespersons for their movements, nor did their movements address women's gendered needs. Sexual liberation in its earliest stages in the states often involved the greatest sexual objectification of women, as when anti-Viet War demonstrated, anti-Vietnam War demonstrators, women as well as men chanted, women say yes, to men who say no, meaning that sex with desirable women was the reward for male political resistance to the war. Then suddenly, out of this vortex, a specifically women's political protest movement emerged, our demand for abortion rights and more broadly for control of our bodies. Until the Supreme Court decision in Roe versus Wade, Throughout the U.S., abortion was illegal, frequent, dangerous, often deadly. The first break in a solid fortress of restrictions came when a popular woman television personality revealed that she had gone to Sweden to abort her badly damaged fetus, the result of having taken thalidomide during the early stages of her pregnancy. Suddenly, it was possible to discuss abortion openly. Women gathered in churches and on academic campuses to give public testimony to having had abortions, defying, defying police and government officials to arrest them. The floodgates of women's angers opened. Grievance after grievance found voice. Job discrimination, wage differentials, the glass ceiling in business and the academy, sexual objectification in advertising, harassment of sex workers, Demands for divorce reform, wages for housework, comparable worth, reform of rape legislation, affirmative action at universities, in construction unions, in the publication industry, demands for women's liberation, and above all for reproductive rights echoed one another from one side of the Atlantic to the other. Abortion free and on demand, our bodies, ourselves, American feminists chanted. The personal is the political, we insisted. A woman without a man is like a fish without a bicycle, we quipped as lesbians asserted their voice within the women's movement. Women's liberation meetings were held in major cities and small towns. Women joined consciousness raising groups. Women faculty and students brought legal suits against their universities. The techniques we had honed working in men's political movements, we adopted to our own needs. Women's powerlessness must end, we insisted. We must find our own voices. These were heady, revolutionary days. Change was in the air, and women, myself included, were caught up and transformed. I became an ardent women's liber, fell in love with a woman in my consciousness-raising group, became a lesbian, devoted myself to studying the origins of women's oppression, and began to offer women's studies courses, although at the time I didn't know much more than the students I taught. Heady, the times were also frightening. I remember the first time I went to a scholarly convention without my then husband, himself an academic we had not yet divorced. I was 34 years old, had published a book and several articles, and was unemployed, or rather had only a part-time job teaching one course at night. I had not been invited to this conference. A friend of my husband, thinking I might like to know what was happening, gave me the notice. No one thought I would go by myself. 
But women's liberation had already transformed me, albeit only partially. Terrified at my own self-assertion, I told my astonished husband that he would have to take care of our daughter for the weekend, got my plane ticket, and went. Not as a paper giver, just as an attendee. Natalie Davis was the principal speaker. I noticed that she was as nervous as she was brilliant. We were all rather new at this practice of self-assertion. Ours were small acts of scholarly self-respect, but acts we experienced as matters of life and death. It was out of this political and personal ferment that women's studies emerged in the United States and, re and in response to women's need to understand the nature of gender polarization and our own second-class status, status socially, politically, economically. A daughter of women's liberation, women's studies, was political to its core. Nor can we forget the critical role women students played in the emergence of women's studies as a scholarly field. In univer U.S. university after university, young women demonstrated, occupied classrooms, threatened legal action if more women faculty were not hired, if quotas limiting the number of women students who could be admitted to colleges and professional schools were not eliminated, if women's studies courses were not offered. They called on those of us with scholarly training to respond to their demands. In the process, working together, we transformed the academy in the United States, ourselves, and our world. Certainly, this was my experience at the University of Pennsylvania, where women students rose up in anger following the brutal gang rape of three young women students. Working closely with feminist activists among the clerical staff, they asked me to join with them when they marched into the provost's office with a list of demands that included women's studies programs, a women's center, more women faculty and women campus guards to handle cases involving violence against women students. For five long days, while hundreds of students seized control of key university buildings, we negotiated with the university's leaders reached out for media coverage, and in the end, won all our demands. I assume that in the wake of 1968, similar events transformed the French and the European Academy, but you must tell me if I am correct. Revolutionaries are rarely trained for their roles. They come forward to answer unexpected challenges at times when old paradigms prove obsolete and new visions are required. Certainly none of us who in the early 1970s responded to the feminist call to discover our collective past, none of us had been trained to study women, nor had we thought to do so until the women's movement transformed us. We struggled to master the knowledge and skills necessary to reconstruct women's past. The vision and determination that characterized these early years of women's history, the excitement of our discoveries, the sense of a collective enterprise among women scholars and students, the ideological and practical need to develop new, cooperative, non-competitive approaches to research, the dedication of those who founded the first feminist presses and journals in their living room, during hours stolen from work and family. All demonstrate that the production of knowledge is never an isolated individual endeavor. It is molded by many minds working collectively and, yes, at times antagonistically, and always against great odds. Insisting upon women's centrality to the reconstruction of the past, we experience the double marginality of our subject and our gender. To understand the trajectory of our own political and historical visions, we must acknowledge the political ferment out of which we came. Certainly, feminist political struggles transformed my scholarship. Angered by restricted gender roles defended as biologically determined, by the absence of women's political presence and voices, by women's sexual exploitation and the denial of reproductive rights, 
I tra trace the origins of our restrictive roles in Victorian religious and medical discourses, following in some ways the work that Francoise de Croque has done in, in Britain. Explore the ways abortion had become illegal and obstetrics an exclusive male project. Examine the ways women used religion to empower themselves and express their discontents. Mapped women's demands for education and men's resistance to women's demands. Studied the emergence of what Henry James called the new woman, those single educated women who between the 1870s and the 1920s insisted on a place of prominence and power within labor and reform movements, the arts and journalism. Discovered rich collections of women's letters and diaries which described a complex world of loving mothers and daughters, sisters and cousins, who shared fears of the marriage night, <coughs> supported one another during pregnancy and childbirth, in death and bereavement, who bathed and nursed one another, enjoying physical and emotional intimacies. But those letters and diaries also revealed a second, far more erotic world, as young women wrote to one another of nights spent wrapped in each other's arms, of passionate kisses and caresses, of love, desire, and jealousy, emotions that extended over their entire lifetimes. As one woman wrote to another, it is not because you are good that I love you, but because of the essence of you, which is like perfume. What was even more surprising, these women did not dissemble their relationships, but openly acknowledged their love to parents, even to husbands, for many of these women were married. There did not seem to be a lesbian closet in the 18th and 19th centuries in the United States and Great Britain. I wonder if there was one in France. You must tell me. Of course, these letters puzzled me. Did words carry different meanings in the 19th and 18th and 19th centuries, or were they far more were those centuries far more tolerant of women's passionate desire than we were in the 1970s and 1980s? Will we ever be certain that we understand these women's words? Nor had I any way to connect this female world of love and intimacy to Foucault's vision of the role homosexuality played in the biopolitics of governmentality. Although Foucault's work has greatly influenced my own, did our analyses war with one another? Complications continue to mount. In the States, as queer theory took root, my work was criticized as essentialist, or even worse, as vanilla sex. Revolutionary days, revolutionary days are of necessity stormy, but I am happy to report that my essay, The Female World of Love and Ritual, has been reprinted from Italy and the Netherlands and Germany to Japan. In 1978, it appeared in Le Temps Modern, and now 37 years later, it is still being reprinted and taught in women's studies courses in the United States. Evidently, women's passion remains both fascinating and enigmatic. All the topics that I have just listed, from the medical profession's war against abortion to women's sexual passions, form the core of my collection of essays, Disorderly Conduct, Visions of Gender in a Victorian America. Now, Francoise has asked me to describe how I moved from my women's history interests to my most recent book, This Violent Empire, The Birth of an American National Identity, which explores the violence, racism, and misogyny that lie at the heart of a US national identity. The path between disorderly conduct and this violent empire was neither obvious nor direct. Years lay between their publications. I had so much political and social history to learn to write the second book. Yet I feel strongly that we have to place women's experiences within larger contexts shaped by race, racism, and colonialism. I proceeded consequently to ponder the ways national identities took form, their processes of projected inclusion, their politics of exclusion, 
and women's roles in these processes. In ways reminiscent of our experiences when inventing women's history, I found traditional historical narrative structures and forms of evidence insufficient to these tasks. Increasingly, I turned to literary critical practices, rhetorical analysis and close readings of 18th century and early 19th century newspapers, political magazines, and novels, to post-structuralist and post-colonial theories. I came to think of national identities as composites of conflicting discourses, as when the new United States represented itself simultaneously as the first modern post-colonial republic, victorious, victorious over British tyranny, and as an infant empire, the arrogant heir to Britain's vast North American holdings. I explore the ways the founding generation sought to obscure the contradictions between these conflicting self-images, as well as between those between our Declaration of Independence, celebration of the, of the universality of man's inalienable rights, and the U.S. Constitution's protection of chattel slavery. I came to see national identities as fragile, fractured, and unstable performances dependent on constituting and disdained others against whom idealized visions of the true national subject could be rendered coherent. At first glance, it would seem little connected, this violent empire, to disorderly conduct. What did connect them were bodies, literal and figurative the swirling interplay of sexualities and bodies, languages and identity, fear and desire fascinates me then and now. Bodies are not simply corporeal sites of sexual desire, pleasure, and pain. They are simultaneously rhetorical constructions. We speak of social bodies and bodies politic, of bodies of knowledge, of law, of ideology. Intimate connections bind these varied bodies to one another. An individual's bodily experiences depend on the bodies of language that inform those experiences at the same time that languages and discourses acquire their meanings through exchanges among embodied speakers located within the body politic. But the interaction of social and biological bodies assumes increasingly complex forms Transformed by the human mind into cultural, a cultural construct, the biological body metaphor, metaph I'm lost my English, <laughs> metamorphizes, becoming a reservoir of effective rhetoric which members of the social body can draw upon to express conflicted and cathected social tensions and relationships. Theories of sexuality, purification rituals, pollution fears, the valorization and degradation of body politics, or of body parts, all can be read as symbolic languages in which different aspects of the physical body were transformed into metaphors for specific social anxieties and conflicts. These varied bodies interacted with one another in both disorderly conduct and this violent empire. The literal bodies of pubescent and menopausal women, of loving mothers and desiring and erotic friends, weave through the pages of disorderly conduct. But so do a myriad of metaphoric bodies. A few examples. 19th century physicians battling for status in a rapidly, exchange, in a rapidly changing social and scientific terrain angrily transformed aborting women into a metaphor for gender disorder and national decay. The term race suicide captures the intensity of their attack on women who they perceived declaring their independence and control over their own bodies by securing abortions. A generation later, a uh, generation earlier, evangelical Protestant women, alarmed by the impact industrialization and wage labor had on the middle class family, created sexual, me me sexual melodrama in which prostitution, that is commercialized sex, served as a metaphor for commerce itself, 
the prostitute for economically exploited working class women, the sexual double standard for the powerlessness of all women within the newly formed capitalist patriarchy. Similarly, literal and metaphoric bodies lie at the heart of this violent empire. In constituting a national identity, one must first imagine a national body politic represented by an idealized body which the inhabitants of a nation must desire to be and work to internalize as their own true selves. But in any heterogeneous modern nation, few inhabitants will actually resemble the ideological national, idealized national body. As I argue in this violent empire, to create a national body politic out of the multiple heteroglossic bodies that constitute the modern state, especially in our age of globalization and the ceaseless flow of bodies across national borders. This requires the construction of a series of imagined others, um, uh, of imagined other bodies whose differences from the idealized national body overshadow the multiple differences that divide actual citizens. National identities depend upon binary systems that contrast the idealized national body to the bodies of multiple others excluded from the body politic as racially or religiously different, inferior, and consequently dangerous. I would argue that today European nations and the United States alike evince this pattern. Think of our common fears of the Muslim saint Poulat or a saint, a saint Papier, or as we would say in the United States, illegal immigrants. Exclusion is the key word. National Bodies Politic, Stuart Hall, one of Britain's leading social analysts, reminds us, national body politics, and I quote, function as points of identification and attachment only because of their capacity to exclude, to leave out, to render outside, abjected. So positioned, these others become, to quote Judy Butler, sites of dreaded identification, against which those of us who claim inclusion repeatedly identify ourselves. Depicting our national others as deformed, dangerous bodies, we reaffirm their corporeality, along with the need to exclude, expel their bodies from the national body politic. And yet we often secretly admire, indeed desire, those other bodies, threatening to dissolve the psychic oppression, opposite, the psychic opposition of self and other into destabilizing sameness. To keep these disdained and desired others at bay, we relentlessly pass restrictive legislation build towering walls along our borders, employ border guards and guard dogs, the term Fortress Europe, anti-immigration restriction and legislation in both Europe and the United States, give voice to these mechanisms of identification based upon exclusion, which the 42 million stateless persons who wander the globe huddle in refugee camps or in our imaginations clamor at our borders that these 42 million literally embody. In this, these ways, key social and political patterns in the United States, France, and elsewhere in Europe coincide and overlap. Studying sexuality and bodies poses considerable difficulties for historians. We deal with the socially, chronologically concrete. But when I was a graduate student, in graduate school, sexuality and bodies were seen as natural, timeless, biological or psychological entities inhabiting society but not social constructions. Beginning in the 1960s and coinciding interestingly with the rise of feminist studies, this vision changed dramatically. Both the body and sexuality were rethought as social and rhetorical constructions key instruments in the ordering and governing of society. But I believe this occurred somewhat differently on each side of the Atlantic. And here again, I ask for your feedback. In the United States, we associate French approaches to the study of sexuality with Lacan and Derrida, 
the Ecriture Feminine, or alternatively with Foucault. While Lacan and Derrida have transformed U.S. literary studies, and the work of Eria Garay, Sexu, and Kristeva electrified U.S. feminists, it was Foucault who had the greatest influence on U.S. historians. Concerned as we were with the social and political contextualization of sexuality. From Foucault, we learned that sexuality and the body were critical components in the production and deployment of power. Surveillance and control of men in all their relationships, their links, their imprecations, Foucault argued, became the object of modern governance. And I quote, power gave itself the function of administering life. Foucault explains, it is over life that power establishes its domination. Power, in this new sense, assumed two interactive forms, the anatomopolitics of the human body and the biopolitics of population. Together, they made biological bodies social problems, and the control of those problems the source of proliferating knowledge and power. Health fertility, mortality, became not natural processes, but occasions for, again I quote, infinitesimal surveillance, permanent controls, extremely meticulous orderings of space, indeterminate medical and psychological examinations, statistical assessments. In short, to, and again I quote, an entire micropower concerned with the body. A host of institutions arose to study and manage different aspects of this body. Statistics were compiled, case studies accumulated, classes of experts were trained, power both generated bodies of knowledge and flowed through them as along a giant capillary system penetrating every point in the social body, the body politic. For Foucault, bodies of knowledge are multidirectional, ensnaring the knowing body along with the body known. Ultimately, all became enmeshed in ever finer and more extensive systems of knowing until their self-knowledge, their bodies, their desires, became parts of the body politics ever proliferating, ever protein, ever more powerful, will to know. These new knowledges and mechanisms of management sexually set, saturated entire populations. Women's bodies, their health, their minds, their reproductive systems became sites of disease and perversion. Childhood became a site of proliferating and perverse sexual instincts, requiring active surveillance by parents, physicians, and teachers. But parents were themselves sexually suspect figures, required by the biopolitics of population to reproduce successive generations of healthy, productive worker citizens, parents repeatedly engaged in perverse, non-productive sexual acts. As homosexuality was pathologized, the single were also ensnared. In these varied ways, power in its multiple forms became interconnected, inseparable, continuous. Clearly, Foucault provided me with a radical new way of reading the proliferating sexual discourses that comprise such a central part of disorderly conduct. Doctors' attacks on aborting unmarried or educated women. Doctors and reformers' condemnation of masturbating children. What transported the, when transported to the American scholarly arena, however, Foucault's analysis encountered feminist reservations. Many of us had engaged the social and political analysis of sexuality years before Foucault's uh, Will to Know appeared in France in 1976 or its translation in the States as The History of Sexuality in 1978. My principal work on these questions was originally published between 1971 and 1973. Foucault tended to uh, ignore feminist uh, analyses. Others of our criticism were more far-reaching. For all his emphasis on the protein and decentered nature of sexualized discourses and bodies of knowledge, in the end, Foucault presented 
us with only one overarching discourse, a single uniform truth of sex, that, circul that which circulated through grids of power. The multiple physical and sexual bodies he discussed were fragmented parts of one body of knowledge, one system of power. Foucault neither explored the role the marginal and the disempowered played in the multiplication of social discourses, nor did he read their discourses as sites of agency and resistance. Feminist race and postcolonial scholars have done both, seeking in proliferating sexual discourses evidence of social diversity, listening for the voices of the marginal and the disempowered, reading from the actions of the oppressed to, their un to the oppressed understanding of power. But again, such writings were not available to us, to those of us studying women's bodies in the 1960s and early 70s. We turned instead to theories advanced by British and American symbolic anthropologists who offered us ways of positioning the physical body within dense social and political contexts. There is no natural or timeless way to experience our identities, our bodies, Mary Douglas argued, and continued. The social body constrains the way the physical body is perceived. And again, this continues the quote. The care that is given to it, the theories about, the stages it should go through, the pains it can stand, all the cultural categories in which it is perceived correlate closely with the categories in which society is seen. Every kind of action carries the imprint of learning. The, most ri the more rigidly structured a society, Douglas explained, the more controlled the body would be, the more loosely organized, the more disorderly, undisciplined body. The closer to the center of power social groups were, the more their vision of the power would reflect cultural norms as they condemned bodies they perceived as disruptive of public order, as monstrous, impure, and taboo. More marginal social groups, however, would celebrate bodily transgression and disorder. In these ways, Douglas led me to see the body both as a social construction and a readily available reservoir which different social groups could plumb for images of society and the expression of social anxieties. Symbolic anthropologist Victor Turner was equally fascinated with the ways the imagination through metaphor and myth linked physical and social bodies. All bodies are bipolar, uh, Turner argued. At one pole, we find the physical body, sensuous, timeless. At the other, time-specific social relationships, conflicts, and anxieties. Individuals and social groups located at different points in the social body drew upon the carnality of the physical body to form affective vocabularies expressive of their social experiences and concerns. The physical body assumes its full meaning only when seen as a culturally specific construct used by, by specific speakers at specific times to express, reinforce, or <coughs> protest their social experiences. The more heterogeneous the society, Turner continued, the more divergent symbolic systems will develop. This is especially true of societies in the process of rapid social transformation or revolution. When the social fabric is rent in fundamental ways, bodily and familial imagery will assume ascendancy. For when the world spins out of control, the last intuitive resource of any individual is her or his own body, and especially its sexual impulses. That at least many feel they can and must control. Battling for social power, they will then represent their social and political rivals as sexually violent and dangerous, sexual subjects who must be controlled or expelled from the body politic. But others, located differently in the same society, will embrace change and glory in disorder. They will refuse the controlling, rejecting discourses of the socially dominant, 
most often those empowered by Foucault's proliferating bodies of sexual knowledge. But always these varied warring discourses are in conversation with one another, adding an element of discursive and ideological dynamism. One of the challenges we face as scholars is to weave Douglas and Turner's dynamic vision of sexual discourses into Foucault's knowledge power grid, our goal to theorize the role, the multiplicity of discourses and the dynamics of resistance play in the production and deployment of power. Such an attempt lies at the heart of both my disorderly conduct and this violent empire. To conclude, a paper I'm afraid is too long, to conclude I wish to suspect, uh, su to suggest how interweaving these approaches informs my current research project, an e exploration of the origins of modern citizenship during the age of revolution. The age of revolution, stretching from the 1680s to the 1820s, witnessed violent political uprisings succeed one another tearing the orderly Atlantic world asunder. These uprisings challenged both the concept of absolute monarchies and the imperial systems they had spawned, saw the establishment of modern post-colonial republics throughout the Americas, for the first time in history questioned the legitimacy of human slavery. France, it is to be duly noted, was the first modern republic to abolish slavery if it did so only briefly, and bringing all these revolutionary challenges together spearheaded the torturous process of constituting the modern Republican citizen. A cultural analyst, I think of the process by which modern citizens came into being as a complex dialogic exchange, or as complex dialogical exchanges, crisscrossing the 18th and early 19th century Atlantic connecting participants in a series of critical political uprisings, the U.S., French, and Haitian revolutions, and the unsuccessful struggles of the United Irishmen societies in the 1790s to establish an independent Irish republic. Critical questions follow one another. What rights could the new citizens claim? Who was included? Who excluded from the new Republican body's politic? Did the promise of unalienable rights transcend the geopolitical state, or did the protection of these rights ultimately depend on claims to citizenship in a particular state? Can a person demand his or her unalienable rights simply because she or he resides within a particular nation, even if the citizens of that nation reject his or her claims to belonging? Put another way, what is the relation between citizenship rights and human rights? Does one trump the other? The answers to these questions are informed by a complex interplay of race and gender in the 1790s and to this day. The longer I study these issues, the more I feel that at the heart of the age of revolution and of 18th century enlightenment thought more generally is a deep-rooted tension between a commitment to sameness and the assumption of difference. The Enlightenment and its political embodiment in the Age of Revolution celebrated a vision of universal political rights and equality premised on a belief in sameness. The United States Declaration of Independence proudly proclaimed in 1775, we hold these truths self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Every child in the United States learns these words. <laughs> all men share, uh, what basically Thomas Jefferson is saying, is that all men share the same nature, the same rights. The French Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen reaffirmed this insistence which was then dramatically rendered classless during the Sans-Culotte uprisings. Yet 18th century society, and possibly all societies, are structured along hierarchical systems of difference. Certainly, 18th century social order rested on the twin axes of class and racial difference, 
made more complex by gender polarization. The tensions between the universal commitment to political sameness and the presumption of racial and gendered hierarchies constituted the basic tension underlying the Enlightenment's political vision and restricting its revolutionary promises. At present, I am exploring the ways the struggle between sameness and difference whirled around one metaphoric and literal figure, that of the mulatta, the mixed race woman. While the figure of the mulatta, mulatto, mulatta, is well defined throughout those parts of the Americas settled by France, Spain, and Portugal, the mulatto, mulatta does not exist as a legal, political, or social category in the United States. Why? As yet, I have no answer. But as a first step in contemplating this conundrum, I have begun looking at the writings of two Anglo-American writers, Thomas Brannigan and Leonora Sanse, and at the much-studied French writer, and you will excuse my mispronunciations, Moreau de Saint-Marie. Mais c'est parfait. <laughs> I have had many teachers, <laughs> all of whom wrote as the age of revolution segued into the era of bourgeois citizenship. I will start with Thomas Brannigan. First, well, first because I can pronounce him easily. Uh, <laughs> second, because he is a quintessential Atlantic figure. And then lastly, because he so explicitly presents the tension within Enlightenment thought between sameness and difference. Born in Ireland, Brannigan had served on a British slave sh slaving ship in West Africa been a plantation overseer in the British West Indies, and then a convert to Tom Paine's radical vision as expressed in The Rights of Man, come to the United States a passionate opponent of slavery. Between 1804 and 1805, years that saw the defeat of France's army in Saint-Domingue and the establishment of an independent black state of Haiti, Brannigan published four books outlining the evils of slavery and celebrating Africans' brave resistance. His condemnation of slavery rested on two radical political assertions, all men's innate love of liberty and the absolute sameness of whites and blacks. African Americans, Brannigan insisted, had the same rights to life, liberty, and self-governance as whites. They loved freedom with the same passion, felt the same rage towards those who enslaved them, murdered their children, or raped their wives. As a consequence, Brannigan insisted, white Americans must work to emancipate their black brothers, and then, fearing what they would have accomplished, immediately expel them from an America that was to be recon reconstituted as a pure white republic. So they're to be freed and immediately expelled. <laughs> it was precisely Brannigan's commitment to the sameness of blacks and whites that, I believe, drove his seemingly contradictory demands for simultaneous emancipation and deportation. On the surface, free fear that freed blacks would massacre whites who had unjustly enslaved them. The image of Sound of Men hangs over Brannigan's writings, colored his demand, but an even more fundamental horror drove Brannigan. His insistence on the sameness of blacks and whites transgressed the systems of difference that structured the Atlantic world, threatening social and ideological chaos, a chaos the rampaging black bodies and sound of men embodied. I propose that the intensity of the ambivalence and fear Brannigan felt at his own undoing of racial distinctions not only informed his call to expel all of African descent from his pure white American Republic, but the sexual alarms that haunt his pages. Time and again, Brannigan raises the specter of racial mixing, of metissage. Black men, if free, Brannigan predicted, not that they would rape white women, but they would seduce and marry poor white girls. 
Rita Brannigan asked, and remember he's an Irish immigrant and he is writing to a large extent to poor Irish immigrants in, the America, in America. Rita, he asked, if thou art a father, look at thy little smiling daughter and then in sympathetic thought survey the many wicked impoverished white women who have been deluded and are now married to Negroes, living in little smoking huts, despised and scorned by both blacks and whites. For it is certain, decent black people shun their company as despicable as much as whites do. Significantly, however, at no time do images of actual mulattoes or mulattoes appear on Brannigan's pages. Rather, he stops horrified at the door of the smoking hut, arrested by the image of the desolate, desolate and deceived white woman. Her offspring he references only with the term mongrelization. For Brannigan, the mongrel mulatta, that, that fusion of black and white personhood, embodied the unimaginable, the unspeakable fusion of racial difference and political sameness. In contrast, the mulatta shimmers seductively on virtually every page of, again, Moreau de Saint-Marie's Saint description, topographical, uh, physical, civil, and political of the French country of Saint-Domingue. Moreau was the spokesman for Saint-Domingue's planter elite. He was as passionate a defender of plantation slavery Organized, he was a passionate, uh, organized around a three tiered hierarchy of slaves, free mulattoes, and elite white planters, as Brannigan was its critic. Of course, the figure of the mulatta in 18th century French literature was complex and multifaceted. She evoked desire and disdain, pleasure and fear. She simultaneously embodied and <coughs> symbolized the debauchery and libertinage royal office holders and European travelers condemned in Saint-Domingue. It was she who seduced, <coughs> uh, depraved, and impoverished the vulnerable white planter. At the same time, she brought beauty, culture, and elegance into his restricted colonial life. But more, she embodied a racialized third estate within the colonial structure. Free Jean de Couleur, Couleur? Couleur. Couleur. affectionately tied to their white fathers, the planter class literally and metaphorically, Moreau, Moreau insisted, comprised a buffer <laughs> caste between those elite white fathers and the dangerous African-born slave population. Fortunately for the white planter patriarchy, she was also generically, genetically the last of her line. The whiter she was, Moreau projected an elaborately colored system of racial mixture, the less fertile she was. Elite white dalliance would never undermine the colony's color-coded racial hierarchy, for she would produce no children um, with uh, disruptive claims to whiteness. Representing the delights of racialized colonial rule, she simultaneously, however, embodied its contradictions. As France would learn, as the revolution in Haiti continued, she would also embody its dangers. Contrasting sharply to these conflicting male images of the mulatta are those found on the pages of a novel, Zelica the Creole, written by, and I quote, a lady of Philadelphia, Leonora Sanse, who is reputed to be the lover of Aaron Burr while he was vice president of the United States. As on Moreau's pages, the beautiful mulatta radiates through Sanse's novel. But rather than being the libertine's plaything, she is the novel's only virtuous character. Sexually pure, she is heroic in her republican love for liberty and courage in the midst of war. She slips through enemy lines, infiltrates General Rochambeau's inner citadel, puts her own liberty and love and life in jeopardy, all to one end, to protect Clara, a white U.S. woman she has sworn to keep safe from every danger and whom she passionately loves. 
Again, what a contrast to both Moreau and Brannigan. Presenting the mulatta as virtuous and noble, was Sanse offering her readers an early abolitionist text? Decidedly not. Deep ambivalence destabilized Sanse's representations. Although we are told that Selica's mother was but one degree from black, Zelica never refers to herself as black or as a mulatta. Rather, she reports feeling an involuntary sensation of horror at the sight of a black and never behold one without shuddering. That's a quote from the novel. Pressured by her father to marry the victorious Haitian general Henri Christophe, Zelica retorts that she will choose death to marry marriage with a black man. At the novel's end, as bestial black soldiers rape and murder every white they can find, Zelica leaps into the sea and into the arms of a handsome French naval officer. This is a 18th century novel. Together they escape that island of death to begin life anew as virtuous, freedom-loving white Americans. Why, one wonders, did Sansei make the virtuous Zelica a mulatta if she then effaces every trace of her blackness. After pondering Zelica for several years, I can only offer a tentative suggestion. Might Zelica, the virtuous mulatta, figure the new United States itself, fusing black and white and refusing to admit that fusion? Does Zelica embody the United States in its racial and ideological complexities? Does she embody the dark secret that shadows the new republic? That the United States claims to whiteness always obscures the black bodies without which America is not whole. I hope these three representations of the mulatta, brief and schematic as they are, suggest both the centrality of bodies to any consideration of political modernity and the ways representations of the body while differing from one side of the Atlantic to the other, will always be in conversation with one another. Thank you.